Hello and welcome to News Clicks show Mapping Fault Lines, where we look at some of the key geopolitical issues around the world. Today, in fact, we're going to be talking about the United States, where fault lines definitely have emerged, especially after the U.S. election results. Uh, as as of shooting this show, the results are not clear yet. Joe Biden has a lead, but Trump has been very aggressive in refusing to acknowledge it. His supporters have been mobilizing all across the country in some places, even demanding that the counting of the vote be stopped. And so we clearly have a situation where uh, both sides are in conflict. Protesters are also coming out on the streets to defend the vote. So we have Prabir Purkaisa to talk about this. Prabir, thank you so much for joining us. So the first question clearly is, where do we stand right now? Because as I just mentioned, we have a situation of a very unprecedented situation as far as the US is concerned. We have a president actively saying that, basically indicating that he is not going to accept uh, the results uh, as in he's not going to, he's not accepting what's happening or what he's seeing right now. So where do you think we're headed for? Well, I think at the moment, Biden has a clear, visible lead. And the fact that the counting has to continue and conclude, and then officially the results announced, it may take two or three days. But if the normal processes, which is what has always happened, does hold good, or you know, uh, Trump doesn't throw a big spanner in the works, then it is quite uh, on the cards that Biden has actually won the election and it's all over about the shouting. And in fact, Trump's reaction is because he knows he has lost. Now, the question was you raised about the fault lines. The fault lines have not emerged uh, because of the elections. As you know, the fault lines have been there. There have been mobilizations on the ground. There has been right wing uh, mobilization and there is white supremacy foot footprints on the ground has been there for quite some time in the United States. But the difference is that it was officially not accepted by any of the major political parties in the US is only two, that they officially can give blessings to such formations. The President Trump has done that in his speeches in different points. And if we put all of that into sequence now, you will see that he's now saying that he believes that because he thinks he should continue to be the president, he can actually do so. He believes that he can bully the rest of the constitutional mechanism that exists in the US to finally give in to him and accept his continuation as president, even if he has lost the electoral college. That seems to be the way he's going and the kind of questions he has raised. You know, I find that not so surprising at one level, because this is what the US government has done in different countries. It rejected the elections in Venezuela. It actually using the OAS, it forced the government in Bolivia to act to what would be called a constitutional coup, but in reality was a physical coup, forced Evo Morales to leave and then we find, of course, after the next election, again, the same party has come to power with a renewed mandate. In Ukraine, the, the Maidan, as you know, deposed a formally elected president. Th this is not the only, uh, these are not the only examples. You have other examples, which the US has always, has done this in different countries, not always, has done this in different countries. Earlier, it used to be coups. Lately, it is constitutional coups backed by mobilization on the ground. Right. This has been the way it has played. Trump believes that he's got a majority in the Supreme Court. He's got a six to three majority. He's packed also the lower courts. So he has got a section of the law on his side, he believes. And he therefore thinks if he can mobilize enough uh, people on the ground, that he has a chance of a constitutional coup in the US as well. So I think that's why we are doing this in fault lines. That fault lines earlier meant between countries or fault lines which had opened in other countries where the United States or other countries played a role. Here you have a situation, the tactic that the US has applied in different countries in the world now Trump says, well, why can't it be applied in the U.S. itself? And I think that is the crisis of legitimacy that the U.S. institutions have to survive. We, uh, we hope that they do because an unstable United States is perhaps 
the worst uh, result of all because an unstable power which is nuclear weapons right. which has the certainly controls the financial systems of the world and is the strongest military power it's not good for the world to have them in an unstable state or have people who are unstable heading such states but that's the scenario we are in right and the other interesting thing of course is that trump is until january to stay in power unlike in many other countries where immediately after the elections the new government takes over so he is at least two months where he is for all ends and purposes the president so there's a variety of options for him to sort of maneuver legally uh, bring more people to the ground and cause even more chaos well till january i think 20th he has the levers of power in his hands because he is though might have lost the election he is the legal president and biden will be president in waiting so even if the elections are announced the election results are announced and he's uh, he's he can then be seen to have lost the election according to the announcements and that itself is another set of questions if that happens then uh, the issue will be that he still controls the levers of power and if he does control the levers of power can he use it against biden legally of course he can't but the fact that the courts a section of the courts may be with him he may have certain challenges and being the pres still the president if the official machinery listens to him does he have the ability to then subvert the verdict that's an issue you know this is not as black and white as it might appear there the electoral college normally does not have an identity of its own it carries out that whichever side has won all the votes go to that particular person but in theory the assembly the, the assemblies the electoral college all of them can also play a role this is something that has not been explored is trump willing to explore it probably yes he might say i don't recognize this fraudulent elections however there is an electoral college they should be independent to vote who knows so all i'm saying is the us has used all of this mechanisms in other countries right. now we have a president who seems to be willing to use it in his own country and he is in power till june uh, january 20th or, or so so only on january 20th does biden uh, assume uh, power if the transfer of power takes place so the question is what is the constitutional mechanisms in the us which can control a president errant president is are there various other loopholes in the us constitution which nobody has explored till date this is an unexplored chapter but it is there so all those possibilities open up with a president who is unwilling to lay down his lay down office and he says even if he has lost the vote he still claims he has a loss that this is a fraudulent vote and there are, and the election has been stolen from him so you know if i don't go into the pathology of donald trump's uh, imagination if you leave all of that out the reality is that he has the levers of control in his hands as of now and the constitution has certain gray areas which i said nobody has really explored nobody wants to go there there is an electoral college which is in, looks like in favor of biden but the margins are very narrow so is it possible for him to mobilize public opinion uh, as as it is being called his militant base and then uh, create mayhem on the streets Absolutely. so these are all un, uh, unknown questions at the moment if we look at the news anchors and if we look at the news media the reason that they they have not declared any of the other states is they at the moment do not want to feed anything to the feeding frenzy of the trump acolytes so therefore they are being very cautious saying let's wait so in another one or two days we have spent four days let's spend one or two days but let's be 100% sure of the result they don't want any such questioning to be there but nevertheless these questions are very much there and as i said it is a playbook it's a playbook which the us has used in other countries so when it happens to them they are, the us people and the us you know media is shocked 
but it has never shocked them when this playbook is used in other countries. It's only when it's, it's used in the United States, they are really in a state of shock that how can anybody do it? Well, how could anybody do it in Bolivia and Venezuela? How could they do it in various other countries? How many times has US had a coup in another country because the popular vote against it? I mean, starting with Mossadegh in Iran, when he was overthrown by a Shah, uh, Shah, it was actually the US and British forces. And Shah of Iran was only 19, let's face it. He was a complete scrooge in the hands of the British and the Americans. So this is a very old playbook that the US has used. And as I said, the only surprise for the American people and the American media is that such a playbook could be attempted even within the United States. And finally, Prabir, sort of going back to the aspect you said about the fault lines already being there, I wanted to ask about how we got to a situation where a substantial chunk of the population is actually, uh, say, doubting the democratic process in the US. I mean, of course, we have people, like I said, who went out onto the streets saying that stop the counting. And the US and its people are always proud to say that they're the strongest and greatest democracy in the world. So how did we reach such a situation? You know, it's very clear that there is a complete fracturing of the US uh, polity and society in a way that we haven't seen, seen before. Now, that by itself would not have been a bad thing. Uh, because there have been earlier uh, polarizations which have been there, but on other issues and central issues like, for instance, race, were a part of the bipartisan consensus over there. So therefore, that this fracturing, which is taking place now, seems to be fracturing at multiple levels. So you have this traditional right versus left, but you also have race very much as a part of it. Now, it's not no longer big capitalist versus the people, which is one part of it. But you also have essentially the, say, the social, shall we say, the social democracy, which looks at race as also an issue on which to mobilize. And that is what is fractured this time. It also explains why, well, all the uh, uh, pollsters have written off Trump saying with the COVID-19 what has happened, the economy not doing well at the moment and various other things that Trump had done, that, his, that there would be a loss of support for Trump. But we saw that Trump's voters came out in much larger numbers than they came out in the last elections. It is a fact that the counter mobilization was also there. This has been the largest uh, voter participation in the United States for the last huge number of elections. Exactly. So given that it is that, that that was the kind of support both sides got. And I will say in this case, it's not really both sides. The vote was either pro-Trump or anti-Trump. Yes. That was really the division of the United States. But Trump represents a certain particular opinion in the United States, which obviously is very strong that he was uncouth, he was this, he was that, all that was true. But in spite of that, what he said struck a chord and it struck a chord amongst a section, which I think we have to accept, has deep racist uh, beliefs that the US belongs to the white population and not to others. And therefore they're willing to mobilize behind Trump, irrespective of whatever uh, his other failings might be, that didn't matter to them, even including the fact that abortion amongst a large number of women would be something they would not agree with, with what, the, for instance, the US uh, president, US president, of course, doesn't speak the truth on this. He was at one point of time pro-abortion, now he's anti-abortion, leaving all of that out. But the, the Republican Party has moved hard right to on, against abortion. But 75% of the American people actually do so think that that uh, Roe versus Wade should not the judgment should stand. But in spite of that, that is not what is informing their vote. What is informing their vote is clearly the racial preference and the fact that Trump speaks in favor of white dominance, white supremacy, if you will. That, I think, is what is really resonating with a certain section. And that is the depth of the fracture that exists in the United States, that the Trumpian politics 
trumps everything else. So I think that is the sum, sum total of what we see. And it is something which, as long Trump has captured the Republican Party, maintains its hold on the Republican Party, this is going to go down to the Senate, to the US uh, House of Representatives. So the, if there is no question, the US, even if Biden does take power, will not find it easy to govern because the Senate is going to make his life miserable. And Trump has captured the Republican Party. There is nobody in the Republican Party who dare speak against Trump's tantrums. All the things he's been saying without providing any, any evidence, he has questioned the verdict of the elections. He has said, I have not lost, I have won. And it has been stolen from me. This is an assertion, no proof required. It's right. free belief. Now, that's what he has gone to the people with. And if that is his inclination, and the fact that bulk of the Republican Party is either silent or echoed him, only a few of them have criticized him, and that also in very soft language, would seem to show that this, not only the deadlock in the US Congress would continue, but I think you are going to see a much more uh, militant Republican right and uh, militia uh, clothed in Republican terms take to the streets and make the country difficult to govern both at the level of people and at the level of the US Congress. So I think we are, we are, in, for hard, uh, we are in, in for hard times because the US being unstable as a country is a nuclear power. It means that nothing will be decided, including the nuclear treaties which at the moment, the last one is still there. As you know, the new start expires next year, and I think in February. Till that point, at least one nuclear treaty is there, but with a kind of disarray, which the US politics is likely to descend into, I doubt that any meaningful international agreements will, can be reached. And we know we face at least three challenges. We have the nuclear weapons challenge, uh, armaments challenge, nuclear, you know, uh, arming, putting weapons in space being also one uh, thing on the one of the agenda items for uh, the United States. But apart from that, we have the COVID-19 challenge, which is very much there. Whether it is Delhi or it's United States, you can see the challenge, how serious it is. And of course, you have the climate change challenge. Exactly. All these three challenges, which are or should be roiling the world, are there today and with an unstable United States, we are not going to see a stability on any, any of those counts. And of course, then we have all the local instabilities the US has created, which I presume it will continue with in its policies. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching NewsClick.